Hello everybody and welcome back to the channel. My name is Blair or the Illuminati and today we're going to be talking about women and autism. I've talked about this very, very briefly on my Asan and Sesame Street video where I mentioned that autism is more prevalent in boys than girls. Now, a lot of my sources say this, even the CDC themselves states that ASD is more than four times as common among boys than it is girls. However, there's far more to it than just boys more likely to get autism. After seeing your comments and digging a little deeper, I've learned a lot about women and autism and the frustrating belief that apparently some people think that women cannot have autism in the first place. So I wanted to take a look at where did that belief even come from and why do people still think this way today? So that's the topic of today's video. That's what we're getting into. So buckle up and let's jump right into it. This looks like it all started in the 1940s, namely with Hans Asperger. He was one of the first to describe, according to the Autism Society, autism-like behaviors and difficulties with social and communication skills in boys who had normal intelligence and language development. Many professionals felt Asperger's syndrome was simply a milder form of autism, and they used the term high-functioning autism to describe these individuals. Now, as I've learned through these videos and through your comments, terms like verbal and nonverbal are generally preferred because it's describing people as, and I'm quoting research, having a dash of autism is kind of insulting. Anyways, autism is a spectrum and Asperger's once his own separate diagnosis is now part of that spectrum. According to the National Autistic Society, although individuals with Asperger's or be on the verbal end of the spectrum may have difficulties understanding and processing language. Now, here's the problem. From the very start, this research was in fact flawed and kind of cruel. Hans himself wasn't just a Viennan researcher. Those of you hearing the 40s and Vienna may already know where this is kind of going, but Hans was in fact aided and supported by the Nazis. You know how like around that time, there was the whole thing with many physicians and scientists supporting this whole racial hygiene idea as they called it, how horrible experiments took place during the Holocaust. Yeah, well, Hans was right there along with them. The Guardian wrote an article summarizing the highlights from a study done by a medical historian, and they said, check the historian, has revealed a scientist who allied himself so closely with the Nazi ideology that he frequently referred children to the A.M. Spielgren Clinic, which was set up as a collection point for children who failed to conform to the regime's criteria of worthy to live. Nearly 800 children died at the clinic between 1940 and 1945, many of whom were murdered on the notorious child euthanasia scheme. In a joint statement of editors of Molecular Autism, Simon Baron Cohen, Amy Klin, Steve Silberman, and Joseph Maxbaum said they welcomed the fact that Czech's meticulous research had finally thrown light on decades of skepticism about Asperger's claims that he had taken a caring approach to his patients. The degree of Asperger's involvement in the targeting of Vienna's most vulnerable children has remained an open and vexing question in autism research for a long time, they wrote in a joint statement. At the time, the term Asperger's syndrome was first coined in London in 1981 by Dr. Lorna Wing. They added, she and we as scientists and clinicians, as well as the broader autism community were unaware of Hans Asperger's close alliance with and support of the Nazi program of compulsory sterilization and euthanasia. Referring patients to a clinic where 800 children are euthanized for, and I'm quoting, being a burden on their parents. Let that one sink in for a moment. One autistic woman, Charlie Devnett, who writes for Guinerica magazine said, it's no wonder advocates prefer not to address negative aspects of autism. The reason for this is easy to understand. First, scare no one. It's horrible to think about autistic people becoming a target for this cruelty. This history is absolutely dark, tragic, and infuriating. I don't have words for it. Seeing the way that people on the autism spectrum are treated from Autism Speaks to the Judge Rotenberg Center to this, it makes me sick to my stomach. Autism as we understand it today shouldn't be compared to how it was viewed through the eyes of a eugenicist in wartime Vienna. Seriously, that doesn't even need saying, and yet I just had to. Now, another one of these views from Hans was that women can't even have symptoms he described. Seriously, he just believed women can't have it, not because of really like research or anything, but like, <laughs> lol, I said so, kind of thing. Now, he did apparently change his mind later, but the damage was already done. However, it wasn't just Nazi supporters spreading this belief. One man named Leo Kanner made extraordinary efforts to help physicians and scientists escape from Nazi controlled territories 
as he was a child psychiatrist himself. Although his intentions may have been good, during this 1943 study with a group of autistic children, there were four times as many boys as there were girls. So whether the studies were done by those supporting Nazis or those against, the same results persisted, that autism was more prevalent in boys. Autism.org lists examples of those studies conducted in later years that only confirmed these biases. So let's go through those and see why, like what happened here and why the results may have not shown the full truth. Lorna Wing found in her 1981 paper on autism and sex ratios in early childhood that among people with a diagnosis of high functioning autism or Asperger syndrome, there were 15 times more men and boys than women and girls. While in autistic people with learning difficulties, the ratio of men and boys to women and girls was closer to two to one. Lorna used the term high functioning and Asperger's in her paper. So I'm just quoting her here for this section again. Today, autism is seen as a spectrum with Asperger's being part of that spectrum and is no longer considered an official diagnosis. And the terms verbal and nonverbal tend to be preferred from my understanding. Just wanted to put that disclaimer out there because again, as we saw earlier, some of the language used from these earlier studies can be, you know, not so great. Now, this is not to diminish Lorna's work. I can agree with some of it and disagree with others. She introduced the English speaking medical world to Hans showing them his research. And we already know how I feel about him now. But she also reported in 1979 that autism was far more common than it was believed to be at the time. And that she was one of the first to realize that autism could be considered a dimensionality. She made breakthroughs for the autism community at large and from what Spectrum News wrote about her, she never seemed to view those with autism as other or lesser in the way that Hans did. Her own daughter was autistic, so I'm sure that must've had an impact on her research as well. Now, she obviously didn't believe women couldn't have it. Her daughter was literally living proof of that, but her paper affirmed the idea that autism is actually more common in boys. Now, because Lorna was such a large name in autism research that it's obviously not hard to see why people believed her. And we will get into how she may have come to these conclusions in just a bit, but for now, let's keep going through these studies. In 1993, a study conducted in Swedish schools yielded a four to one ratio of boys to girls. Now, there were around a thousand children by the looks of things in this study, so it was a much larger group than even Lorna had in the past. Then in 2009, a survey of adults living in households throughout England found that 1.8% of men and boys surveyed had a diagnosis of autism compared to the just 0.2% of women and girls. In 2015, the ratio of men to women in National Autistic Society's adult services was three to one, and the ratio of boys to girls in their charity and schools was five to one. Two years later, Looms and other researchers analyzed existing prevalence studies and found the ratio was nearer to three to one. All of this is to show that studies are hugely varied, but every single one shows men diagnosed more than women. So why is this the case? The National Autistic Society does say that biological factors may mean men and boys have higher prevalence, but there's so many other factors out there to things that haven't even been taken into account during these studies. Now, Research Autism has been a very long article and I would really recommend it if you wanna dig into this topic a little bit more. I can't read the whole thing right now because we'd be here for a very, very long time. But I'm going to go through the bullet points and explain like what they give as to reasons why women are diagnosed with autism less than men. If you want to read the full article again, it will be in my sources down below. It is a very interesting read. So here we go. The stigma that women don't have autism is not only believed by the general public, but also by diagnosticians. For example, two women reported that specialists told them that girls don't have autism and that a girl was too complex to assess for autism. Some specialists believe that females with high levels of testosterone are more likely to be diagnosed with autism following a popular extreme male brain theory. Popular culture has also reinforced the stigma that only men can have autism. Media portrayals of autism tend to only show male characters, which can lead the general public to believe that it's only seen in men. Previous studies about autism carry the assumption that autism only affects men because researchers only recruited men to participate in their research. Fortunately, researchers like Professor Francesca Happy are studying gender differences in autism. Results from these studies suggest that autism manifests itself differently in men and women. After all, it's not just up to the doctors here to diagnose a child, but a parent taking their child to the doctor in the first place. And if parents aren't aware that this stigma exists, they may be less likely to seek out proper help and diagnosis for their child. 
The article continues by saying, women with autism are generally able to mask or hide their symptoms better than their male counterparts. Scientists elaborate on masking, which they also call camouflaging, by stating that women camouflage three to four times more than men do, resulting in the lack of diagnosis for women. This phenomenon calls for constant and elaborate effort to mask one's symptoms. This effort often results in physical exhaustion and extreme anxiety. Scientists write that men also camouflage, but not as frequently as women. This phenomena is a natural adaptation strategy to navigate reality. Many women with autism have spoken about the difficulties of being diagnosed. For instance, Johan de Combe, who spoke with News Hub, said she was finally diagnosed at age 48 due to the effects of an autistic burnout, which she defines as the long-term psychological exhaustion of trying to act normal. This autistic burnout, she states, can cause depression and other mental health issues. The effects of this burnout illustrate why individuals need to get diagnosed, which helped put a name to her experiences. Comparing the rates of autism of men and women is shocking. Only 8% of girls with autism are diagnosed before age six, while 25% of boys with autism are diagnosed before this age. While 50% of boys with autism are diagnosed before age 11, only 20% of females with autism are diagnosed prior to this age. These statistics illuminate the staggering differences of diagnoses for men and women. One reason for the lack of women being diagnosed with autism is because of the expenses. In the public sector, many doctors give incorrect diagnoses of another disorder or provide simplistic assessments of the patient's social skills. Women have to go to the private sector to receive a diagnosis, which is more expensive than the public sector. Because of this added expense, most women evade diagnosis to save money. This notion is especially common when women are told that women don't have autism, so it is pointless to continue pursuing a formal diagnosis. Diagnosing autism is critical because it allows the individual to access resources to help them cope with this diagnosis. It shows that individuals that even thought that they are different, it is okay because there is a giant network of people with autism. These advantages to a formal diagnosis in combination with women realizing that they aren't being accurately diagnosed has led to an increase of women being diagnosed with autism in recent years. After being formally diagnosed, women with autism report that they stop masking traits of autism and fully accept their diagnosis, both of which increase their self-confidence and self-efficacy. Women who are undiagnosed and women who have autism often feel isolated because many people don't believe that women can have autism. These women are either turned away from a diagnosis or told that their diagnosis is irrelevant. While the misconception that women can't have autism is decreasing and more women are getting diagnosed sooner, the problem isn't resolved. We must continue to educate medical professionals and individuals that women can have autism and that we must find a better system to assess autism that looks at how autism manifests itself in women. All right, so I know that was a lot from that one article, but I really feel like it did an excellent job at explaining a ton of aspects as to why women don't get diagnosed nearly as frequently. There's the misconception aspect, the mimicking aspect, and the stigma that even doctors may have about these topics. And you'll remember that for the phone survey study, of course, far, far less women were diagnosed than men. But that doesn't mean women have it that infrequently by comparison. And again, it's not to say that biology doesn't play any role in this whatsoever, but it's absolutely not the only factor at play. And it's important to recognize women's autism as valid. That's one of the reasons why I was so thrilled to see Julia on Sesame Street. Or I can say how I was so thrilled when Asan was still involved with the program before Autism Speaks got involved. One essay by Joey Murphy on Public Source says, women my age weren't called autistic growing up. We were called awkward or rude and we missed out on services. She writes, what is wrong with you? I can't remember the first time I was asked this question, but I was asked it all the time as a kid. I'd be humming along, doing my best at whatever I was doing when all of a sudden someone would shriek at me and I'd discover that I had just invented a previously unknown method of doing the thing I was doing the wrong way. You know me, if you're over the age of say 40, chances are you went to school with a girl like me. I was more or less on even footing with you academically, but I struggled with everything else. My physical movements were often spastic and jerky. I blurted rather than talked. I couldn't hold a pencil properly. I got upset when rules weren't followed. I was eager to please, yet I sometimes said the dumbest, rudest thing possible. As I grew up, I learned to mimic you, but it was never really natural for me. I am hopefully the last of the generation who were considered to be bad or lazy, but were actually in need of a diagnosis. 
But in my 40s, a Facebook reunion with Carrie, a schoolmate who had known me from preschool through high school, added the final weight to the scale. She and I hadn't talked in 20 years, but the second that FaceTime connected, she burst out, I think of you every day. My son is autistic and he reminds me of you every day. I was somewhat like those other kids, someone who'd known me my whole life, who had a modern understanding of autism and was pointing out the bleeding obvious, you are autistic. I sought a formal diagnosis, it was 2013. The young, helpful neuropsychologist had no problem after hearing my childhood stories, diagnosing me with Asperger's, I was 42. I was tired of being a disaster. My hope was that the diagnosis would open up access to support and therapy for executive dysfunction and sensory integration. It did not. The syndrome is widely associated with children and there is a dearth of treatment available for adults. I had lunch with my friend Pat recently. She's worked in the autism services field for decades and I wanted to pick her professional brain because I was having trouble tracking down census numbers for how many women and girls are diagnosed each year and how that number had changed since the DSM criteria changed and awareness had improved. In between bites of the blandest dish I could find on the menu, I asked her, who's kept track? No one, my jaw dropped. I'd assume that change in the DSM signaled a new era in research. No one, she repeated. It's so important to learn from Joey's story, to see how frustrating it can be when a proper diagnosis isn't given. Things are slowly changing as awareness and criteria improves, as she mentioned, but there's still plenty of work to be done here. And that's one of the reasons I really wanted to shine a light on this topic. When you see statistics from reputable sources, you don't question them. Honestly, I didn't question them either. But even supposedly reputable numbers may not be all that accurate here when we consider how differently girls and boys or women and men present their symptoms. So no, this isn't talking about a bad business. And I certainly don't think the doctors or patients that don't understand a young girl has autism are malicious but it's something I wanted to bring awareness to after seeing it in my comment section and after the videos I'd done about autism recently. Autistic women and girls of any age need access to resources and the stigma needs to be removed. Otherwise, people like Joey will continue to persist when Joey herself wished she knew sooner to otherwise understand herself better and get proper help. I really hope this video can help to spread awareness because autism has become a topic near and dear to my heart ever since my first video on the topic. Seeing your responses and stories have been incredible and heartwarming. And I really hope that this may have helped shed some light for some of you as well. And maybe perhaps some sort of enjoyment from this, not entirely sure though. But with that being said, that's where we're going to end today's video. Let me know if you learned something new in the comment section down below. If you liked the video, give it a thumbs up. And if you're new here, make sure to hit that subscribe button for more videos like this. And if you want more content from me, you can go ahead and pop open that description box where you're gonna find links to my second channel, all of my social media sources for today's video, all the good stuff will be linked down below. So again, thank you so much for making it to the video. Love you guys, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.